Thank you all so much for being here, and thank you so much to the artist. My name is Yeshima Bet Milner, and I am the founder and CEO of Data for Black Lives. We are a network of scientists and activists working to make data a tool for social change instead of a weapon of political oppression. And we launched Decompress on June 19th, Juneteenth of this year to recognize the role that black people have played in the origination and evolution of electronic music, but also to reclaim electronic music as a tool for social change in a time when we need it the most. As today's incredible panelists reflect in their work, in their messages, in their voices, there's incredible possibilities that occur when we do reclaim music as a black technology. And in today's conversation, our focus is on what would it look like if we were to center reparations in the conversation? And what would it look like if there were more institutions that supported, platformed, and created space for the people who were at the forefront and at the helm of developing this musical tradition. Black people have reinvented pop culture over and over again. It was through oppressive and yes, genocidal conditions that we were able to birth these musical traditions that people celebrate globally, that have changed the world globally. And it was, it is without further ado that I briefly introduce Susie Analog, who is a musical genius and truly a pioneer of this entire scene and has kept it true to its roots. Thank you so much, Susie. I, I'm gonna let everyone introduce themselves, but I wanted to do a brief, thank you so much for being here. Ezalie Jean, who is an amazing selector, amazing DJ. I first saw you DJ when I first moved back to Miami and learning more about you and learning about the organizing work that you've been doing here for years, I knew I had to bring you in for a conversation about how can we change the conversation, but the agenda nationally, but specifically here in Miami. Thank you. <laughs> DeForest Brown, author of my favorite book, Assembling a Black Counterculture, <laughs> and representative of the Make Techno Black Again, is an intellectual powerhouse and truly revolutionary voice in this work of building the archive and building the canon and really asserting the role that black people have played in, in particular in the development of techno music. So thank you so much for being here straight from London. <laughs> and of course, last but not least, Mandy Harris Williams, known as Ideal Black Girl Online and in the community and the movement as a true voice, a true pioneer, uh, with searing commentary and the creator of rave reparations, which uh, without that seminal work, without making those demands years ago before anyone was even talking about the black voices and the, black, the role of black people in this space, um, your work really laid the foundation for us to be able to build Decompress. So thank you so much for being here as well. And, I'll start out by asking you all, how has electronic music, how has black music shaped you personally, politically? Um, I'll start with you, Susie. Okay, that's easy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hey, y'all, uh, thank you for being here. Super happy to talk with y'all tonight. Uh, for me, electronic music, so, so the question is, how has it shaped me? I mean, okay, like the first song that I really heard that I recognized was different than hip hop was uh, The Percolator. Yeah. So I was immediately shaped by techno <laughs> from the jump. Um, even when I make my songs today, I really try to reference that raw feeling that I felt as a kid listening to the percolator, that this was like imperfect, that it wasn't trying to be this polished, perfect pop product, um, that it came from somewhere that it, it sounded like my cousin recorded it. 
So I, I always want to give that feeling with my music. So I'll just start there. The percolator set it off for me. Um, techno came in the very early single digits of my life. And then I learned how to, well, I didn't, even, I taught myself how to record on cassette tape. So I started recording myself at nine years old and I was just like, well, they recorded like, all I need is this thing. All I need is one mic. <laughs> and, um, and I had a karaoke machine with two uh, side A, side B tapes, you know, front and back. So I had four different ways I could record things, dub things, and um, play around with sound. And I was like, it sounded like they recorded the same way I did for the percolate. When he said, it's time for the percolate. It sounded like I did that, you know? <laughs> so um, from there, I just became... Uh, committed, committed to sound, um, committed to the way the beat moved. And the beat to me sounded like something that I can understand. I never knew why at first. I never knew about the polyrhythms. I never knew about uh, the information that was embedded into techno music that came all the way back from my ancestors. I never knew that at that time, but I found out that that was a message that was left for me that yes, I could yes. just tap into. So I, I learn more every day. And now I feel blessed enough to teach what I know. And I still discover even through that, um, just this journey is, is quantum. You know, we're not in one reality. We're in all the realities that happened before we got here. So I'm sorry, y'all. I- <laughs> yes. <laughs> I love techno. Oh. Yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I, 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 I just feel so honored to be the vessel that can understand what that information. Shay. Yeah. So, so, so electronic music, I, I didn't think about, I didn't know. I didn't, I didn't know they stole it from us when I was a kid. So. I, and I, I was born in Baltimore. So I grew up on B-Mark Club music. Everyone says Jersey Club now. Okay, B more came first. All right, I'll come take my class. Um, <laughs> you got to enroll, but um, but yeah, B more came first, and it's it's a variation of uh, house music. But I didn't know they stole that from us. I didn't know that the creators of that music were suffering and and dying mm-hmm. from having lack of medical care. I didn't know that was happening. I was just because I was a kid, and the OGs, the big bros, were making this. The, the uncles and the cousins were making this. Um, but because I was a black kid, I could sit and say, my uncles and my cousins are making this. So, you know, like, it's a part of me. The, the, yes. the story of electronic music is a part of my black story, my, yes. my indigenous story. Being here, my family is indigenous uh, to North Carolina. We have all sorts of stories up and down the East Coast, from the Bronx down to Florida. My dad was born in Florida, actually. Um, but yeah, I, I'm just, and that's how I came to understand music. From Miami bass to Be More Club, that wasn't a jump for me. That was like, hello, I, I'm in a dance group for my community. I grew up dancing, performing, doing theater. Um, and so, these, this is what we were dancing to. This was in my culture. I didn't go to a club to find it. I didn't go to a rave to find it. I didn't find it when I was 19, 20, 21. I found it when I was five, six, seven. You know what I'm saying? Probably before then, but yeah. Yeah. My mom wasn't playing it. My mom, my dad, they love jazz. It, I'm it's in there too. Yeah, and it's in there too because the samples and the, and the cadences from the percussion, like it's all, that's, it is jazz. It's just jazz with more technology, you know? So, so, you know, I, I found that, I came to find that electronic music was my jazz. Um, I thought hip hop was my jazz. Hip hop is something else though to me. I don't know if it's my jazz though. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. And it's, and it's all electronic and hip hop is also electronic music invented by black people so and we'll definitely touch on that um but what you said about being in the blood and being stolen and being an inheritance I think that's part of the reparations frame and demand as well so you want to go next Jean? (laughs) thank you hello hello oh it is on okay what was the question again sorry (laughs) just 
Right. It was a question that you posed on our prep meeting oh, I that did. I love. Okay. <laughs> Where it was I how, did. what, what has music taught you about the world personally? And yeah, politically? yeah. Well, first of all, what you said was, exa- yes, I'm like 100% on that. Um, for me, um, living in Miami, um, living in this city all my life, uh, the internet played a big role in that. So a lot of my discovery outside of, and also my experiences being like a, black alternative person was through being online and connecting with other people and um, all over the world too and um, sharing music, doing listening parties online. Um, So yeah, that's kind of where it started. But my musical background though, like my parents are from the islands. um, And so, um, you know, it was like a tradition, like every Sunday, Saturday or the weekends, you know, you're cleaning the house, um, so which means dad has the system going and the records playing, you know, he's playing like my dad, my dad's a very big um, dub reggae roots fan, Same. Um, like very big. Yeah. I was like, we're not Jamaican. <laughs> and I didn't understand it then either. Cause I was just mm-hmm. like, God damn, this sounds repetitive, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, <play> something else. <laughs> um, but um, so we had that. He was like a big Peter Tosh fan and all that stuff. And like mm. Lee Perry, all that stuff. He loves all that stuff. So, um, but then as I got older, and that's like one facet, I have like a big family and they are very like into music. And that's like our mm. way of like also like expressing, you know, just going like life, you know, having to work all the time. Mm. How do you decompress music? Right. So, um, yeah, going back to like cleaning, that was like the Sundays. My grandma as well growing up, she loved Maria Makeba. She mm. loves Cesare Vora. So that's like wow. the, the continental, like going back to the continent. She would be like, you like Mary McCabe. And then she taught me how to do like the, the Shosha singing that she would do. Mm. So there was that. Um, mm. And then my aunts were really big Miami bass, but I don't really play it. So I can't really like give you more on that. But mm. um, I grew up listening to it in the background a lot. And like, you know, that and... Um, a lot of hip hop. My aunts like were all every room they had was like posters on the wall. So that was like my way of like, oh, okay. Just so basically like my my experience and my my whole thing with music is like uh, listening to everyone around me and them and being first gen and also my aunts being first gen and just like I guess making sense of the world through like how are we going to how are we balancing this dual identity as well? Like Maniacs. black American and Caribbean mm-hmm. in Miami. And just doing it through like, yeah, like music. I don't know. Um, Just listening to tons of stuff. And um, yeah, that's what I did. I did that. I went on the internet, did that. Find people who didn't like just like one particular genre. Like we're into like all types of things. Um, I also never travel outside of the world. So that was outside of the world, outside of the country. So that was my way of also discovering like what's going on outside of America. And like also diasporically, like, you know, I'm really into like, you know, Afro-Lucifone music, which is like Cape Verdean and Angolan and Brazilian and like feeling like some sort of home there, you know, yeah. and then their whole electronic music scene too. But then also like being very influenced by like the roots of like their traditional music and like, you know, I don't know, just kind of, I can go on and on, but basically like, yeah, that was my way of like learning about the world outside of like my own periphery. Like, so yeah. Yeah, that's it's it's played a big role for me, and also grew up on PBS too. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, just just tr- literally taking it as experience of traveling, because I couldn't travel. My parents we couldn't afford to travel, um, so that was my way of yeah. Just through music was just like yeah, discovering on the internet and things like that. And, and hope that answered. Yes, the question. traveling <laughs> and one yeah. thing you said too about learning about different parts and people and cultures within the diaspora through music yeah and how that was made possible through the internet and oh, yeah. through electronic music yeah so thank you thank we'll you. get back into that too <laughs> but DeForest I think your mic's off Uh-oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah there we go <laughs> no no, it's actually really nice to hear you all like kind of talking about your experiences because I mean, I think I sit between both of you where I have a really large family of musicians and, and singers and, you know, writers and things like that. And it's, the music is just always on in the background, you know, whether it's like Miami bass, whether it's crunk music, whether it's like electro, whether it's, you know, New Jack Swing, like it's all a type of electronic music that all kind of spurred out of these some American, some Japanese, like, instruments becoming, like, available to people, like, in the mid-80s. Um, and, you know, I, I was born in 1990, so, like, it's... 1990? Yeah. 
So it's a weird thing kind of being like right on the cusp of that and like seeing this transformation of blackness in real time between like a kind of like analog like funk culture towards a more like cyber culture. Because hmm. I know exactly what you mean about it being on in the background because I've heard like Cybertron and Juan Atkins and, and things like that my entire life. My dad would play like Atomic Dog and my mom's from New York and would play a lot of like Salt and Peppa and Nucleus and stuff. And it just, it's all there, but it's something about using SoulSeek and Wikipedia at the same yeah. time that assembles a canon together. Yes. And that, yes. that's been my primary, uh, I guess, interest in writing about electronic music. Um, Cause I started as a journalist writing about black electronic music before there were a lot of people like doing that. Um, yeah, yeah. And it's no one. Was. It was interesting kind of being one of like, usually, usually the only black person like in the, in the industry at that point, like just like writing. And it's, it's interesting because there's a lot of like narrative lines that just don't make sense. Like mm. in comparison to your own like lived experience. Mm. Cause like, for example, in, like European electronic music culture, the percolator is never brought up. That song just isn't there. And specifically what you're talking about with using cassette tapes, because that's exactly how Juan Atkins did it. It was like mm. in Drexia too, they were like playing all their tracks live and overdubbing them on cassettes and then taking the cassettes to vinyl pressing plants. And it's that this idea of like rediscovering the origins of techno repeatedly mm. without the blueprint is mm. something that's been really Intuition. Sitting under my skin lately. Mm. But yeah. Mm. Andy? I'm so annoyed I have to answer this question after all three of you. <sighs> um, do you want to switch seats, Susie? <laughs> um, okay, so I would say, like, my musical legacy that brought me to the relationship that I have now with black electronic music. Um, I guess it started like probably as a kid in New York and club music is just, it was a texture. Mm. Um, and it, you know, it also had to do a lot with um, gay pride. I say gay pride very particularly. Um, and being within a certain world, I guess like, you know, since we're talking like uh, upbringing, like my parents were like kind of older when they had me and they had like, you know, a lot, they had like a lot of single fabulous friends like when I was born. So I just kind of, I'm an only child too. So I hung out around all of these like very stylish, sophisticated adults for whom club and house were just textural. Um, it was on the radio and then I would, but there was even more so to the source. My mom is from Chicago. And so I knew when I went to Chicago, I was excited to listen to the radio. Like, do you ever like get excited? Like, I don't know. I guess it's kind of like old school because now we just listen to Spotify when we travel. But like, I used to get excited to go to different regional radio areas and um, Chicago has, still has amazing house music radio stations. Um, I think it might just be down to one at this point, but um, so yeah, that was kind of like the foundation. And then I think I did like a two year stint in just about every genre because I was before your time, I had Bear Share. And <laughs> give it up for Bear Share. <laughs> um, and then you would, you would load the bear share to the Windows media player and there was a, a program called Music Match. And that was your Wikipedia. <laughs> See, the youngins don't know. <laughs> so, <laughs> How old are you? We're in 1990s. Okay. The skincare regime is working now. Um, <laughs> so, um, I... I collected a lot of just experience through genre um, and it wasn't really until I think when I was 18 I rediscovered those things and I was like ah oh, yeah um, I it was speaking of the jazz of it I realized I needed to study with music it had to like have fewer words and it had to be busy 
And so I would do bebop and I would do like, this is how I like started to learn about like internet radio and I would just listen to electronic music on internet radio. And, um, so yeah, I just kind of like rediscovered it and it felt familiar. Um, but it was never something that was, I still don't abide by genre. <laughs> so it was never something that I could say, oh, I like this or, oh, I like this. It was just like, oh, right, right, right. Like this sounds like 1994. Um, and so then when I got out of college, I moved to L.A. And shortly thereafter, I started going to a party called a club called Rhonda. Shout out. Um, and I was like, oh, OK, I get it. And then I'm like, all the like. I, I sensed it. I moved towards it. And then I, it eluded me. And so then, like, the only thing that kind of, like, made it difficult to really deeply identify with in L.A. is, you know, um, beyond, uh, I'll, like, full disclosure, Rhonda is my, like, music, house music fan. So <laughs> I'm prejudiced. Um, but <laughs> I would go to, like, these other raves, and um, it was like all white people and I was like that's not how I remember the vibe <laughs> of who was celebrating to this music when I was a kid of course my parents didn't hang out with just like that many white people so like but I knew something was up it smelled fishy and um, I was starting to talk with my parents about kind of like the this strange disidentification and remembering being in Chicago as a child and trying to just figure out like, what was this sound? Because it wasn't just, it wasn't even just the house music radio stations. It was like the smooth jazz radio stations at midnight were kind of playing that smooth house. And so I was like, I was trying to place it and um, and then my cousins started talking. Then I started to be able to drink and my cousins started talking. And my cousin, my mom is the youngest of six. So my cousins are really like my uncles and aunts. And, um, my one cousin was like, you think you know about house music, which is the beginning of a great education. And then like proceeded to tell me such canon stories about their own experience like hmm. my my cousin butch shout out cousin butch his claim to fame is that he was the first straight guy at the warehouse <laughs> because he was so broke that he had to go live in the building with all of the gay dudes this is how he explains it. I think there's more sensitive, but, you know, still demographically consistent way of saying that. He was living with all of the gay dudes downtown, and they were like, you should come out. There's loads of girls there, but there's no straight guys. <laughs> so he started going to the warehouse, the family den. Some of my, my mom's sisters would show up kick him out of the club, just like family antics at like the birthplace of house music. And so once I heard all that, it, you know, it's really cool because I became entitled and I don't feel like that often. <laughs> That's the word that we should use. Yeah. Exactly. And I was like, so why in LA when I go, hmm. ain't no niggas. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> And that was the beginning of a of a of a commitment to mm. a cer a certain very loud involvement. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. And you know, I'm so glad that you touched on house music. We are gonna get into that in a little bit in the conversation. But one thread that I'm just seeing through everybody's initial introductions is this idea of intuition and how even if you heard a sound here or there or there, you knew. It was as if it was like a memory of the past or the future. And I think that, again, speaks to uh, the part about it being stolen and the part about it being our inheritance. And 
But first, I wanted to discuss a bit. You touched on the 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 warehouse, and for folks who don't know, the warehouse was the Seminole House Club in Chicago, and where pe- people call the birthplace of house music. And it's so cool that you have a familial connection there. But I want to, you know, go back to you, DeForest, because I think one quote from your book really touches on sort of what we've been experiencing here in Miami and all over around the battle, like how electronic music has become a contested space and a political space. And you talk about how techno is not, as is widely believed, a generic component of the globalized drug-induced nightlife economy, but it's formulated out of an intuitive response to the urban degradation plaguing Detroit and other cities around the US in the late 20th century, techno is evidence of the post-civil rights movement, black youth adapting to the industrialized Northern states using technology available. Um, do you want to speak to a bit more about that? If y'all want to read the, hear more, uh, buy the book, it's awesome. <laughs> Assembling a Black Counterculture. No, it actually is kind of funny that you would bring up that quote with us being in Miami, like being in the South and I'm from Alabama. So there's like, you know, this big Southern connect. And I think in general, when talking about black people, the migrations, the the several great migrations that have happened, the one that's happening right now where people are leaving the North and moving South is never being addressed in terms of like how these cultures kind of emerge and these regional sounds happen. And it's, I, I wrote that, that statement specifically to kind of separate techno from house to then put them side by side so that people can kind of, cause there's, there's this assumption that techno and house has a four on the floor beat. And the thing is house has the four on the floor beat because Frankie Knuckles was using a metronome as a drum machine. Juan Atkins on the other hand was using pawn shop gear and has studied data processing and was like doing a lot of engineering work. Um, and how should I put this? Basically, house music is an archival music where you're taking kind of like promo records from, because Frankie Knuckles was an A&R for Billboard. Him and like Larry LeVon were working for the major record labels, getting promo music before anyone would have them. And then they would play them on the floor to your family who would be like, yeah, that track goes off. And that would make sure that a record label in New York would know what a hit was, which is something I find really interesting is like the sort of intuitive data processing that would happen in queer club spaces in Chicago separate from Detroit where one Atkins was kind of a nerd in his basement. And I mean, as a nerd in my basement, like it's a, it's an interesting thing. Cause I mean, he was imagining entire worlds inside of a mixer. Whereas in Chicago, there was this whole other world that was happening full of people, but all of these things are formulations of what black people could and would become after the civil rights movement. Um, and I, I just, in general, draw a big line mm-hmm. at 1967 mm-hmm. for black folks. And I, and it's, I mean, there's a whole, you know, there's a whole book about like black bourgeois and like, um, you know, the, the new blackness that, that emerged after that, um, that I'm really concerned about. I'm really concerned about this concept of like working class intellectualism in the black community. Cause I mean, we're all working artists, yeah. like, and it's, Yeah. <laughs> you want to jump in, Susie? I know I just, I, you can speak on techno and beat making. I, yeah. I know I love this because he just gave you a history lesson. I teach this lesson this week in class at UNC. I teach and I call this and I, I find it funny that no one has ever said the music that's house and techno is Midwest dance music. Mm-hmm. It's Midwestern dance music. That's all it is. Like it came from this specific, <laughs> these cities are not mm-hmm. that far apart mm-hmm. and it's dance music and, and let's just call it that, right? But then there's a war over what's techno, what's house. It's Midwest. And it came from, and let's call it by where it came from. It came from the Midwest, United States and, and these things were happening. And, and I... I do share the story of how one kind of came from a disco perspective and then the other really came from an inventive perspective because the people who were creating techno were the children of people who were working in the factories for Ford and making your cars and making the highways as the highway system was still being created throughout the 50s into the 60s and then they had to meet the demand of making the cars. And segregating black communities at (sighs) the same time, yeah. 
redlining yeah. all around. Yeah. And and this was all happening at one time. And what could people do to shake it off? They had to dance. Mm -hmm. They had to dance it off because it's stressful. Like all this development plus the civil rights movement just barely happened. Mm -hmm. It just barely. So you don't even know if you are counted as a human or seen as human. And how can you make your presence known and felt through the beat? Third it. Do the beat. And so the beat had to be fast. It had to be percussive. It had to let you know, I'm alive. Mm -hmm. I'm the here heartbeat. and I'm moving. The heartbeat. Mm -hmm. And that's where we got techno. And that's where we got house. And, and there were a lot of other things happening. <laughs> there were a lot of other things happening. Just like today, though. There's still a lot happening. And I think the response and the uh, reclaiming of electronic music, especially for Black people, and people of color is because we have to make that happen. We have to be heard. We know we have to be heard. <laughs> I'm just sampling the street. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, but not, we have to be heard. And we, we know that we've been through this period of discovery. We had the internet boom. We're like, we could talk to each other. We can message each other. We can send each other stuff. But it's like, still, how do we uh, sustain that? And, and make our presence heard, we find that beat together. We come together, we can come into spaces. So um, I don't remember what your question was, but <laughs> I'm ripping at this point. <laughs> but, uh, but, but no, I, I'm, I'm just happy that we got to this point because I, I, knew, it was, I knew it was gonna come. Like, I don't know, whatever they embedded me with, my ancestors, you know, whatever they embedded me with, I said, we're going to reclaim this because who wouldn't want to dance to the percolator? Like, every time you play this, people lose their shit. They lose it every time, but it's like, it's going to become old for, for it only to be that track. So we're going to have to make new tracks. We're going to have to make new information because people want new information. And so even with my own productions, I always made dance variations, but I didn't know the cadences. I had to really actually educate myself. Um, the fact that I teach people styles of electronic music now uh, through my professorship is like funny because I taught myself everything by taking my childhood, taking these fragments, going back and talking to my family, going back and realizing what was happening, what we were listening to, um, what we were dancing to, and saying and making finite decisions and just saying this this is that, this is what it was. And no one can tell me anything else because this is from within my culture. So then people wrote books about it and they helped me reaffirm that these thoughts are true. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, it's been, it's just been such an interesting process, but I would say uh, my experience in, as far as creating, producing electronic music has been effortless due to my ancestors that part, but existing within it, existing within the business structure that they created for electronic music has been insane, uh, very harmful. Like, oh, <laughs> very we can jump to that question. <laughs> okay, I'm just, <laughs> the, the, how you know, I, we, how I get it. this is the third take in press. People should know the origins by now. And we want to create space for people to talk, to, to talk about the appropriation. Um, you know, right now we're grappling with genocide overseas, conversations about settler colonialism and years of occupation and apartheid. And, you know, as I've been, as I've been, I've been doing a lot of speaking and touring and, you know, arguing that apartheid is an algorithm, right? These policies that we see in one place are applied and copied and pasted all over. And apartheid started in South Africa, it's happening in Palestine, and it's happening all over here in the US, right? Here in Miami, this, this community right here, what we've, been, what we've had to go through just to build this space, what we are going through with the city and, and the landlords, it's, it's indicative of just how difficult it is. And I want you all to speak on your experiences of dealing with, as you said, ex uh, you know, being a vessel, intuitively knowing and inheriting and embodying this musical tradition, this epistemology, but then having to fight with demons, and <laughs> you know, literally, like people who, you know, are 
commodifying black joy, but despite, despise it. So you want to start? Because you were just, yeah. <laughs> Why, yes, I do. Um, well, first of all, I want to express solidarity with Palestine. Um, when I uh, first came to understanding uh, the niqab that has proceeded for 75 years, um, I was introduced to it by... Um, okay, so I'm on the academic black market, which means I write, pe I write people's papers. And I had a student who was utilizing... Um, was utilizing the hummus wars, which is a real thing, where different cultures come together and they, you know, see who has the best hummus. And um, I, I have a knack for talking about cultural appropriation because... Um, <sighs> Cultural appropriation is an indicator that genocide is in the recent past, currently happening, or slated to happen soon. Um, as far as my understanding, it suggests that you can take a people's culture and not nourish the people and the land who have created that, given birth to that, given are in the genetic stylings and relationship to their space, uh, attuned to, to, to bring that up, to, to, to plant the chickpea seed, to tend to the farm, the farms that have been for years destroyed by the Israeli Defense Force. Um... So the hummus wars, it sounds like it's about hummus, but it's about the right to inherit space, uh, the flora and fauna of that space, to, to occupy the relationship with flora and fauna of that space, the cultural products of that space. So, you know, to talk about house music, techno music, electronic music, as an indicator, to see, to see these spaces as an indicator of a far, far more serious um, entitlement to, to the protest cultures of what they put us through. Um, what a fucked spiral that is, right? Like, <laughs> in order to get respite and, and recharge, um, we have created this space. We've created this space from literally... I'm going to say 500 years because we know that those rhythms are coming out of West, Central West Africa. Um, we even, we can, eat, we can trace <laughs> each step on our way to black electronic music, inclu including something, something like the lyrical content, right? Of how, okay, so we have these rhythms, they're layered over these kind of like perhaps Old Testament leaning, some New Testament, you can get into, you know, where your origin stories are coming from there. But um, so to, to experience, you know, Uncle Butch and the revelation of, you know, Auntie Laney Poo pulls, pulls up with her new boo and kicks Butch out of the club. It's like, hee hee, ha ha. That that's a funny family story. Um, but it, it also suggests that, um, that I live here and I occupy this space and I have for a long time. So when I come into a space that is ostensibly about uh, celebrating that culture and celebrating with one another, <laughs> um, I should feel some of that. I should see some of that. It should be, it should be, um, I should feel entitled in those spaces. So we're talking about occupying space, divesting culture, um, divesting livelihood. You know, we talk about like, this is giving me life. Um, 
So I, I've been like, I've been like, uh, I've been having some cognitive dissonance, as I think many of us have, um, because I want to see, uh, I want to see an integrated commitment to decolonization, which. It is not frivolous when I am doing the work and then I come out on Friday night. Like, that's not frivolous. That is a needed part of the cycle. Um, what did Mickey Blanco say? <laughs> then God created the beat. <laughs> you know, on the, seven, on the seventh day, God created the beat. I need a moment of rest and respite and uh, to have that space colonized and to be looked at in rooms like I don't belong there uh, while I'm trying to recharge myself for the fight that I've been committed to the whole week is not a fatality, but it is a social death. And it lets me know that real death is my real death, my body, you know, are, are not like safe. Um, so yeah, uh, it's always been free Palestine, frankly. Thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, sorry. Can I have the question again? <laughs> sorry, because I'm, yeah. I'm like agreeing with everyone, obviously, and super for it. Um, what was the question? Just about your experiences with appropriation. And uh, I love what you said, Mandy, about uh, cultural appropriation being an indicator of genocide and even bringing in the term social death, that's really important when we think about like necropolitics, which is like who may live and who must die. And it's, it's not disconnected, it's related. And I think that's what we want to kind of show in this panel, like the struggle for reparations in this context is absolutely intertwined with the liberation of other places. But I wanna hear from you personally, especially in Miami. Yeah. Let's talk about Miami That's specifically. Relate, yeah. Because yeah. um, <laughs> it can be a large conversation, but it can be like micro. Yeah. Um, well, huh, Miami. Yeah, my, my only home. Um, well, you know, I will say that I will go back to um, doing anything here as like a black femme is, you know, very tough. And it very much is like, you know, you get undermined really easily. You get like cornered, you know, um, energetically, I would say more so because we're all out here tapped into like, we're like, we're like into magic out here. <laughs> so we pick on that, pick up on that shit really quickly. But um, yeah, so, you know, like for me, for example, like I, a couple years ago, um, joined this vinyl social club that was a really great concept. And I, because I enjoy the um, experience of coming together with people and playing music and, you know, like sharing that, creating conversations. A lot of the great things happen at the table, at the bar, you know, at the, in the club, whatever. Um, so that was like my kind of introduction into like, all right, like putting events together and, um, you know, kind of being a host in, in many ways, something that's really needed in the city. And um, no one was really doing this situation, like kind of, especially like, bringing records to like this like dusty like dive bar um, and letting everyone and anyone sign up and play these records, whatever. But anyways, as I was doing this, it was garnering a lot of attention. And, um, you know, it wasn't my thing. I just kind of added myself into it because I was like, this is a beautiful space. I want to do this like with you guys and really br bring this to a lot of people that I know that can use this as well, who are maybe don't have equipment at home, but like music and like want to do this thing. And basically what I was doing subconsciously was creating a platform for folks to even be comfortable with maybe, you know, like an incubator for people who want to be DJs in right. some way. Exactly. Um, and it was cool. It became that a lot of people that 
would go to this night, like ended up like becoming DJs and like getting booked and all this stuff. And like, and, and for a long time, I well, for a long time I knew like I helped with this thing. Um, but because I think it was, and, and I don't want, I like, I really wanted to not be like, oh, is it because I'm black? I'm but like, it really was because I was outspoken as fuck, demanded to be respected, knew what the fuck I was doing. Because mm-hmm. I love, I like, I'm good at like creating ambiance. I'm good at like putting, bringing people together, connecting people. And I made that shit happen in this dusty ass dive bar in North Miami. No one was going to. Right. Um, and um, people envied me for that. And, um, you know, um, basically ended up removing me, you know, when they were getting press and um, were intimidated by me because, you know, I was able to really, you know, bring the space in this way that was like, you know, bringing a lot of people from like, I'm talking like all over Florida and people traveling parts of the country just to come see like what I'm doing. Like why this like, seems jumping all the time in such a place like Miami, like what, like how, you know? So anyway, to say like, um, I don't know if it's like, appropriating, but more so like, I want to talk about like- Erasure. Huh? Erasure, I, I yes. erasure. erasure. And not yeah. wanting, because I was so, like I, again, because I was just so confident in this thing that I did and I knew I was good it at it. It came natural. People saw that as like, hmm, she's, she's, why is she so demanding? Why is she like so sure of herself? Like they weren't comfortable with it, you know? And um, so yeah, they were getting pressed and they had like, a newspaper article and it came out and I was just no mention of me at all. And actually the people that were mentioned in the article were like white people, um, white Latinx people who did an event once and no mention of me at all. And that really hurt me because, you know, I really brought this, I, I kind of, I excavated this thing out of the, the cobwebs of this really like, you know, dive bar spot. And I, and the and intention was for me was to be at a place where I felt safe, my friends felt safe. And I have, you know, my friends are like all different experiences, all walks of life, felt safe, economically priced drinks, like a place where you don't have to be freaking like, you know, pretentious, just come out, sign up, play your records listen to whatever you want and just enjoy and then birth new relationships and experiences but because I was behind that and that was really the face of it and right. I was like confident in it like they were like nah like you know it was like a it was like a, a way from the like strike me out of it and they did and it get it brought me into this big depressive hole and just kind of like you know like really sus about you know the city and doing events and and also, and I didn't really go into also like when I did mm. that, like they were um, record stores. And, and this, okay, this is a good place actually. So there were actually record stores in this city that benefited <laughs> yeah. from, yeah, exactly. That benefited from, you know, this thing that I did where there were record stores that were like making money off of like, mm-hmm. oh, people want to buy records now because of your party. And they're coming to my shop. And and then they would come to me and like this way, like, let's do this event with you. And then like kind of, it was like disposable actually. So I was in some way like this commodity, commodified like salesperson, you know, because of this party I was doing and they were offering their space, their record shop or their museum or whatever the hell, whatever. But yeah, just, I, I don't know if I'm making any sense, but- You are. Um, yeah, I was using this way, but I'm sorry. I don't know. I'm a witness. No, thank you. I'm a witness. <laughs> I'm a witness. Oh, your witness is in the crowd. And I am coming to, to this part of the ceremony <laughs> as a witness. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And since you started that, how many vinyl only listening bars have been opened in Miami? A lot. A lot. A lot. I come uh, back and it's like four. And, and like, how oh. many more record shops actually opened yeah. after you started that? Yeah. All within like a five mile radius. I'm serious. Yeah. And I, and I, again, I don't want to come off salty. It's more so just seeing this. I don't want to say desensitize. Like it's this almost like insensitivity. Yeah. Towards someone who, because I was so like assured of myself and like, like demanded space and, and not, you know, just knew what I was doing. Like I felt confident in that, that people benefited, they profited of it, whatever. And this is also like an old, this is an old tale when it comes to, you know, black people in music and fashion, <laughs> you know, once not being able to like wear designer clothes and all of a sudden hip hop is back and let's get those clothes on those niggas. And like, you know, just kind of comparing that to, no, I'm, and you laugh, but it's serious. Like it's a serious thing and it's same with music. Huh? I said it funny. Okay. <laughs> but no, but it's, and I felt this way too. It was like, I was using this way and, and I'm not, and I'm, I'm over it now, but just to see that I was able to 
really the domino effect of that. And then there are you know people that I know that are like doing now vinyl. And like again, I want people to do them. It's this is it should be a movement. It should be like a, everyone should be a DJ. Everyone should have fun, and it should be a fun thing. And like share it but the fact that like i was like and i, I didn't start it i just i um you were a rebirthed it in this way i, I co-hosted you and were, I really, were the impetus <laughs> i don't know yeah yeah and so, this shouldn't be about credit this should be about you know the, the whole point of this panel is reparations and this question of what would electronic music in this city in this country look like if people were given reparations, if if you were supported valued given capital <laughs> imagine what this community would look like you exactly. know yeah. and that's the question you Susie, you wanted to say and we're gonna get back to you too. no i'm just like how is this not the copy and paste tale of what happened with electronic music black electronic music in this country mm-hmm. like how is this not exactly what happens and and it's the fact that your story didn't get published yep it's these little things that happen and that's what we have to fight for that's why we have to make data we like mm-hmm. actually have to create data we have to have stories we have to have recordings yep. and archives we have to be able to this conversation is <laughs> getting recorded i'm actually happy it's right. not the feds right right <laughs> nope. not this time it's right. counter surveillance <laughs> counter surveillance yeah. yeah and and they and can listen to media I, i'm always like have them listen <laughs> listen listen in listen good because we this is what we're doing i mean not no i'm not i'm just saying like i i'm not i'm not scared see when you when you found something and you stand on something and that comes from your sweat blood and tears you cannot be scared like you cannot be scared to stand up and stand on it and to just be like a soldier of what you're creating so even though that part of your story happened that's not the end. It's not. Right now, you're telling your story and, and this is going to reverberate and this is the fight. This is the fight. This moment yes. is the fight. Yes. So I just Thank want you. you to know that like those people are corny. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> New party, Gene at the Dolphin. Like they... And they won't, they won't prosper. You, you can't prosper that way. Well, they, well they didn't. It, it's almost like, I mean, my love for music and social and like sharing that in a space has deepened actually and I still have that and the thing is that too was out of love and I didn't ask for much either that's the thing too um and so you know just because I demanded respect and doing this thing like you know and I think this is again like a lot of people can relate to this like you know you you know uh throw a party you know um you know it's it's all like out of love people are doing it out of you know a profit uh, you know you can sense that it, it doesn't feel the same you know and then shit comes out whatever but yeah i don't know i just wanted to say like yeah I, but what I, do they always say you're so nice you're so yeah. nice you're so nice but you're not knowing this is coming from my heart this is coming from my heartbeat this is coming from my dna this is coming from the congo <laughs> Literally. Right. Yeah. Um, this coming from stuff y'all don't know about. That's why you feel like you have to steal it because you never feel like you'll get an original thought in your life ever again after you meet me. Mm. Period. I mean, chess. <laughs> I'm sorry, y'all. I've Literally. Been so many founding situations that got me out the paint. Mm-hmm. That got me out the paint mm-hmm. just like that. And I, I was like, what's wrong with them? I'm like, oh, this is the once in a lifetime event for them. Mm-hmm. Like, they'll never, ever come back to this feeling mm-hmm. like, I got something. And, and meanwhile, it wasn't you. <laughs> right yeah i mean yeah. with our experience here i know people talk about what would they do if it was like tulsa oklahoma that's happening now right again what we've like just even trying to build this space we've experienced so much opposition but we are so thankful for everyone who has supported us we do have to wrap up the panel soon because i want to make sure that we do have time for the artists and performers but to Forrest, i want to make sure you you had a point earlier and i mean the final question and i do want to get a couple questions from the audience is what what would reparations look like like speci- try to be specific right like for us reparations look like actually having more spaces and venues right. not just one or two or yeah, yeah. so mm-hmm. admittedly i do have a really specific vision of this in the sense that the electronic dance music music industry from around 2008 until about 2019 amassed about two point I think it was like yeah 2.5 billion dollars in usable wealth that they lost half of during the pandemic because Europe Europe itself was not able to actually institutionalize electronic music in such a way that their clubs could remain open and in the UK right now thousands of clubs are closing like each week um 
But what reparations, at least for me, would look like is using the intellectual properties embedded in the original master vinyl recordings of what particularly Juan Atkins had of techno because a lot of the house records weren't pressed well. No, 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 it's not a thing. It's a thing. Actually, no, there's a... There's an actual dude in Chicago, a white dude, who pressed all those house records and did not tell Frankie Knuckles, didn't tell Larry Heard, didn't tell Future, and sold them to the, to the UK. Okay. And the, a lot of the house musicians didn't even know it was in Europe until like around 92, oh. whereas techno was slightly more intentional in terms of sending it over, but they lost even more because everyone, everyone black knows that house music is black, but techno is the white thing. But there's a chronological reason for this. But no, the main thing about this is if you take the $2.5 billion, you can throw that at Mississippi's water system. Exactly. You can throw that at Flint, Michigan. You can throw that at a lot of things. Yeah, and particularly not fueling Israeli government's genocide or with this like sort of false Christian ideal of, yeah, I actually don't have time for that. Um, But... Yeah, I mean, my specific dream for electronic music is to gut the entire industry. The entirety of the industry where the money is counted in Ibiza by... Um... <laughs> Man, I, I can... No, I can name some names. No, I can actually do it. No, there's about five white men in Europe that... One of which works for the BBC. There's the ADE conference in Amsterdam. All these folks, if we were to get together and sue the actual shit out of them and put that money into black communities, there'd be enough. There'd actually be enough. It, there's, it, it's a, a fascinating... Because actually, Jay Lynn talks about this a lot too because we all grew up from like black mu- music education programs. I've played trumpet since I was six mm-hmm. and was taught by my dad, taught by a series of people who mm-hmm. knew what they were doing and were not allowed into the recording industry proper. Industry, yep. And it just... Yeah. So sorry, that hit my particular sore spot. Yeah. I just because thank just, you for yeah. that. Yeah. I mean, what you just named was very specific, right? And you know, we're all about litigation, <laughs> if yeah. need be. But seriously, when you think about when you put a numerical value on the wealth, it does yeah, that things. It changes things. Yeah. Anyone else want to share any specific brief ideas of reparations? Brief. I, I, we can I, get more into it later and in later conversations, but for the sake of time, I want to respect everybody's time tonight. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to say I've been living my life like, like in reparations mode. Mm. Like, since yeah since I could get a license or like since I could be like mm. uh, a citizen, I was like, oh yeah, give it back though. Like, you're going to take the taxes or whatever, but give it back, though. Because <laughs> you, you can't take from me because it's, it's too hard. You made the playing field too hard. So give it back. Mm. So when are you going to give it back? <laughs> so uh, in 2015, the United States government sent me to East Africa. Mm. Uh, all expenses paid in an armored car to go into communities in Kampala, Uganda, and to teach the community how to make beats. And then do a performance for the community. We oh. also taught DJing, MCing, and breakdancing. Is a hip hop diplomacy, mm-hmm. and I challenge everyone to find a way to get something back mm-hmm. from this system. Mm-hmm. 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 However, you can, mm-hmm. because the more we do it, mm-hmm. it's going to add up. It's going to add up to that two point five billion dollars. The more we mm-hmm. think like that, we mm-hmm. can connect with our peers and our friends and our community to get th- because it can really happen there's mm-hmm. there's all these programs there's so many programs there's so there much is. funding there's a lot of money out but there. what do we do with it as individuals what do you do when you wake up every day to fight against this like how do you spend your money how do you spend your time mm-hmm. who do you talk to and what do y'all talk about start there mm-hmm. the reparations mindset mm-hmm. it's just about getting back from the system and mm-hmm. Since doing that, I got sent to Ghana last year. Last summer, I did the same program again. And uh, the professor who started that program vetted me to become a professor at University of North Carolina. And now the state of North Carolina pays me to be a professor. And, and I'm telling you, it's, it's a mindset. 
So how can we like do that's just like to pay to pay bills, right? Overhead, right? Mm. That's little. We're trying to get to two point five billion dollars though. So what can we do every day till we get there as individuals? Yeah. You know? I think it's exactly I think it's two prong. I think there's the Mac or like federal policy, but then there's also the individual things like you're talking about, right? Of like, as I was talking to Chelsea Machi with staff earlier, there's so much funding out there, but people don't even know how to get it. And a lot of us are honestly kind of prevented in its paperwork and it's, you know, red tape. But part of what we're trying to do at Decompress is also release. Yes. And liberate some yes. of those funds. And for fill good out the paperwork. I did the application a night mm-hmm. before. And then mm-hmm. the United States government sent me to Africa for the mm-hmm. first time. I'm like, this is how it starts. Like, mm-hmm. And since then, since I went there, there is electronic music festivals that's happening there. There is... Mm. African techno that's coming East African techno music I put out a compilation called Gukuba which means the heartbeat it's in Lugandan mm. um, the East African indigenous language to Kampala and we collaborated uh, with a collective there Afro diasporic North American producers collaborating with East African techno producers and we created a 22 track compilation called Gukuba and the British council paid us mm. for that as well, an they art definitely project. owe a lot of money as so. <laughs> <laughs> so so let's get I'm just saying they like, definitely owe a lot of money it's, the so. money is out there yep. it's, and it's not just about the money but the resources like yep. let's let's all keep talking about how we can get it back and make it right and make these rooms happen and make these nights happen like this you know yes, and have exactly. it more regularly until it is just not even it's, it's like normal oh, yeah, it's yeah. Norm. yeah mandy i'm inspired yeah. <laughs> thank you yes you're a hero it's so impressive <laughs> Um, Okay, so when we put together Rave Reparations, I would say there were three um, distinct things that we were trying to achieve. Um, Number one was to uh, work, we were working with promoters. Um, I would like call a promoter and just be like, I would just bully them. (laughs) This is after like 10 years of like being in rave spaces. I knew everybody. And so I would just get people on the phone and I had like started to build a bit of a reputation for really talking that shit. And so I would just talk that shit to them. Mm -hmm. And I would say, you know, this is really ludicrous that I go to your party and I'm the only black person there except for the headlining DJ. Mm -hmm. And so I would say like, I need, I need 30, 40, 50, 60, et cetera, names that I can put black and brown queer people on for free entry to your party because I know that you're letting old Tom, Dick, and Harry come in because they're your buds, they're your bras. And I was like, me and my peeps is getting in too. Um, Second is uh, that we, um, there was a point at which, so Los Angeles rave culture is pretty much underground. Mm -hmm. Uh, We close at 1.30, don't go there, it's not cool. Um, and, uh, what sustains, um, house and techno culture is the underground rave scene. Um, but in order to, because it's underground, there's no better business bureau who you can complain to when they're systematically pushing black people out of that space. And I would, I would talk with black people who were trying to throw parties and they would say, oh, well, you know, the, the people who own the spaces would be like, we, we're not sure about the crowd you're going to bring in. No, you are sure. You just, you just don't want black people in your space. So um, that was just re- relational diplomacy. I had, you know, white people who I was leaning on at that time to do the right thing. And I said, you're going to walk these promoters into the space and you're going to make sure it happens. The third thing was stop booking your white homeboys to open for Honey Dijon. Like, it's silly. It looks stupid. Like, they can't play. They have bad taste. And they don't dress. They don't dress. (laughs) So, thank you so much for that. And I love the work. The work, as as you said, you know, the work around rave reparations really laid the foundation. And 
set the bar for so many venues and clubs, just not just in the U.S., but internationally. And I think, how do we see the rave, the dance floor as a microcosm, as a as a site for like the club is already a laboratory for fashion, music, political engagement. How do we also see the club as a laboratory for reparations? Right. So I know we're like on time, but maybe we have a chance for one question. Good one. A good question. Anybody have a good question that you want to ask our amazing panelist? <laughs> okay. Well, I can close off with a question that we had planned. <laughs> what is one track that you are excited about playing tonight Ooh. and why? So, we want to start? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited to play Onland Interlude. It's a track that um, I worked with Tiger Paw on the Get Free album. And it was just an entire process of us like sitting in quarantine, feeling so like constrained and terrified and excited and hungry. And, um, we created this whole world. Like there's a story, you know, it's, 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 cl it's classic techno storytelling. Um, and we created this world of like this, this historically inspired new maroon society. And the, um, there's like a protagonist who is kind of like a, I don't know, just a grouping of all these, spirits that we were calling in and um, I listened to that track again today getting prepared for this and I to think about own land um, and to think about the the bridge between land liberation and black techno it was just like wow we really felt it and to be in the space where you're creating art that aims to prevent instead of react. Um, I, I feel so honored to have demanded that at that time with Tiger Pond, so honored to have been invited to collaborate on that album, and I'll be really excited to play it for you. Awesome. Woo, thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah, well, um, I'm excited to play a Stevie Wonder track. Uh, just because I, I mean, I know it's like electronic music and CB definitely is part of that as well. No, for sure. For sure, yeah. The Tonto. No, for the sure, tonto. for sure. That's all I gotta say. Um, it'll be Ribbon in the Sky because that song has held me very um, warmly lately. Um, and um, I think just with all that's going on in the world and has been going on, I just really wanted to end it on a... It ha there's like a gospel to it too so I just want I want that so I want to tap I want to hit that parasympathetic nerve I guess tonight um, and, and play that so I will be playing Ribbon in the Sky Stevie Wonder because it just when I play you'll yeah you'll feel it I don't know it's just it's Stevie Wonder so <laughs> but yeah thank you is it me? yeah uh, I'm excited to play my new track Nice to Meet You uh, thank you I just dropped last week uh, with Poet Surprise finalists from Gary, Indiana, Jay Lynn, uh, who DeForest uh, referenced a little bit earlier. But uh, just the fact that there's a Poet Surprise finalist, Black femme, making electronic music from Gary, Indiana. Indiana. Um, and we have a track together, and they're a genius as well. Um, I can't wait for y'all to hear it. you want to mention a track okay i just play music so and you're going next yep. so give it up a round of applause for our amazing panelists and speakers tonight and for such an amazing we covered so much in such a short time please stick around the bar is still open food is being served and deforest we'll hear you for our speaker music Oh, no, you're first. Sorry. <laughs> you're first and then DeForest. Excuse me. Jean, you're first. <laughs> Woo, give it up. 
<laughs> and divorce is second. So we can hear Stevie first. But thank right, you all so much. Yeah, she, um, can I just say thank you for um, this was my favorite curated um, panel and also the blackest panel. And I love that. And your, your, your mission and uh, what you're doing is real cool. It's real smart. And I appreciate you for having us here. Thank you. I mean, yes. give it up. Thank you. It's, it's, it's my duty and my obligation. So absolutely. thank you all. It's brave. Thank you. Everybody enjoy the rest of your night. <laughs> Let's dance.